Luis, how are you? Good morning, my very good friend. Doing very good. How are you? Good. Oh. How? All right. All right. We are so ready. I'm so ready. You are? Yes. I posted uh, <clears throat> this uh, oh. Zoom, Zoom meeting on LinkedIn, um, hoping to drum up some attention. Um, so I invited a, a couple of uh, acquaintances and friends. Um, and uh, although today we're going to talk about the Four Noble Truths, but the mm -hmm. thing about the, the all, any, any Buddhist stuff has been so, uh, so cliched and over, over discussed that uh, I, I was talking about the science of composure. <laughs> maybe I, I should have, maybe I should have said the science of stiff upper lip. Uh, anxiety versus imperturbability. Im imperturbability. Um, so, so we'll see if we get any traction, any oh. uh, interested peoples. How was your week to begin with? Oh, it was. It was well. It was good. Good. Good week too for me. Very busy. Let's see. Yesterday I had I had a good uh, a good meeting through Zoom with a uh, with a guy in Virginia that taking a class. Uh, several classes with me at, at an online university. Well, it's it's trying to become a university hmm. to uh, to teach uh, an accredited uh, Buddhist uh, set of courseworks in the Nalanda tradition, the tradition of of Nalanda in India. Interesting. What, no. uh, what the no uh, Buddhist uh, monks had to go through to learn uh, Buddhist uh, ethics, philosophy, logic, mm -hmm. grammar. And so one of the course work lines of courses is, is to learn to read uh, Tibetan. And eventually be able to translate Tibetan works. That's got to be some work. <laughs> <Because That's... laughs> a lot of work that hasn't been done. Still a lot of stuff to be translated. Yeah. A lot of text. So he was, te uh, he was practicing with me maybe he'll show up i invited him oh who did i who did who did i oh that was me i joined, <laughs> I'm joining. So i i noticed um, that sometimes yes that's me again <laughs> sometimes you you appear twice on the zoom uh, display meaning that you have two entries and I, actually you have two different cameras and i can see you from both perspectives which is very good thing. Perspectivism yes. is my <laughs> stuff. <laughs> see. Oh, I joined the meeting. Yes, there I am. In my ultra wide camera. Leave room for everybody else. Don't take too many spaces. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Are you limited to the amount of um uh, people that can join this uh, Zoom meeting or? 
see. Uh, now this is confusing. Oh, no limit. No, now it's uh, it's it's giving me some echo. I I uh -oh. get you stereophonic. That's going to be confusing. I've started, or the meeting has begun. The four points that when clearly thought out will, <laughs> will what? <laughs> That's will the question. Stress. What's the question? <laughs> the four thoughts, no, the four points when clearly thought out and understood will remove stress. Uh, and that's for those of noble hearts to practice, to understand. That's, that's where the noble comes from. It's not that the mm -hmm. truths are noble, but the people who practice it are noble for, for mm -hmm. even attempting to understand those four points. Arilla. <laughs> that's the proper Arilla. translation or something like that. Yep, I, uh, I'm right there with you. <laughs> Arilla. Yes. Uh, so, hmm. It's interesting that in Tibetan Buddhism, you can ask someone, what are the four noble truths? And they may roughly get it. But then when it comes to the Eightfold Path, uh, they, uh, they, they drop off. They're familiar with it. Because, yeah. uh, or may, and maybe many Buddhists are like that too, because, because the path mm, is not studied in that, uh, in those eight, it's just the path, and and it depends on what school, like each one emphasizes different things. Like in in yeah. uh, in the school I've looked at, it's the Lam Rim. Lam Rim means that's Tibetan. It means uh, the path, the path that is a a, a, a stage in stages. Yeah, stages I, of the path. Yeah, I was uh, actually I was uh, listening to Alan Watts who contends that uh, uh, the, the, the way, the path, is the method. Actually, he says that Dharma, or Dhamma, is uh, the method. Uh, he, he contends that uh, it's been translated uh, poorly, and that the, the real meaning uh, from the Buddhist or the, uh, the, the Hindu standpoint, uh, Dharma or Dhamma, is the method, the method to attain the dukkha nirodha, the the, the uh, uh, elimination of stress, of mental suffering, or vritti nirodha, which we discussed last week, the agitation of the mind, the whirlpool of the mind. Method. Yeah. So I've seen it. I was reading last night the first sermon of of the buddha that's a bad a, that's a bad word there right he, he didn't sermon anybody the sermons are for the uh, judeo christian uh, religion so maybe admonitions teaching. admonitions or the first teaching the first carefully planned out presentation because after enlightenment, he is saying, wow, this is great. I better go tell somebody. Ah, they wouldn't understand it. 
forget it. Yes. I'll just sit here. That's right. I'll be, I'll be happy and content. Sat there for a couple of weeks, undecided what to do. It then so, the gods and angels and things like that. Devas. Nudged him to your calling. You have to. And so he prepared a plan, a lesson plan, a syllabus. Syllabus. <laughs> yes, 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 but yes. Who shall I teach it? My, ah, somebody's joining. Mm. I heard a good, good. No, that's still us two. <laughs> us three. Knock on the door. You, you're, tri you're twice here, so uh, it's three of us. You, you, and me. Unless it's, um, <laughs> unless it's on the, my phone. You should not be there twice. Door. I don't know why you're there twice. Go ahead and will, eliminate will, yourself will, once. <laughs> eliminate yourself once. <laughs> oh no. I can't eliminate my phone. I'll eliminate this one and then join again. While you do that, I was I was uh, looking at uh, looking up the word aria, arilla. Um and it says here that uh, frequently, frequently used in Buddhism, and that can be translated as noble, not ordinary, valuable, precious, pure, um, exalted, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, you know, I, I always use the word conventional and non-conventional. You're completely gone now. <laughs> Bye. I know. I thought you were gone. <laughs> so I, I, now I can hear you. Maybe you mute, muted yourself. Uh -uh. No sound. Oh. Uh, now sound. Um, so I, I, I often use the distinction between conventional and non-conventional in terms of wisdom or uh, perspective or knowledge, conventional knowledge versus non-conventional knowledge. So, Ariya, I could, I could uh, translate as non-conventional, not ordinary, a different perspective. Instead of looking at things, looking through things or at the nature of things. So that, that would be a good explanation to, to oh, that word that is used there. Good. We have visitors. <gasps> David. The, the meeting, meeting has started. started. David Good morning, in the house. house. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Heidel, you're still on stereo. You, you repeat or twice. I can hear you twice. Can David, you hear me? Now we can hear you. Good morning. Morning. How you doing, Luis? Doing good. Happy Saturday. Happy way. Saturday to you too. Oh. Boy, what a week! It's a good oh. one or a bad one or what? A week. <laughs> in, all, in, in all its in all its uh, content and beauty, it was it was a uh, compli complicated week, but you know such is life, What's right? Going on? Yeah, everything is complicated. Nothing simple. That's right. So we made it. So it's right. the weekend, and now we are in our favorite get together uh, to think, to share, to create, to imagine. This is this is becoming such a such a nice routine. I really look forward to every Saturday morning um, uh, chatting with you guys. Well, that's good. Yes. That's good. I got a question yes. for both of you again. Aha! Uh -huh. Yeah. Good start. Good start. What do you think is the strongest instinct within a human being? Without a doubt, survival. Staying alive. That's, that's the strongest thing. Homeostasis. They call it homeostasis. I want to stay just like I am. That means stay together, stay, stay alive. You know, stay, stay. 
So survival, I think, is the, the, the deepest uh, instinct. That's why we, we are prepared to avoid uh, stinging, uh, pain. Uh, we, we are wired to avoid uh, uh, dangerous situations. That's why we, when we look down at, in a precipice, we, 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 we back off. It, you know, it's, and we know we're not going to jump. We know we're not going to step forward and jump. But we just the, the very idea of maybe, maybe I'm going to fall and die makes us back off. It's, it's just wired into us. I believe that that is the most basic instinct, survival. What, what is the question again? The question is, uh, what is the most powerful instinct of a human being? Instinct, instinct. What about self transcendence? Is the or the the instinct to attain self transcendence? Could that, since it's at the at the peak of the pyramid, or in the revised version of Abraham Maslow, they didn't get <laughs> nobody got the memo on. You have to go by the facts there. I, so what is, why do you ask and what is your answer? <laughs> well, I was thinking about it this past week, you know, and the thing is, I, I just noticed in the past, you know, uh, ants and just about all things that mm. all living things, you know, that from ants to roaches to whatever, they seem to have a innate thing about self-preservation, which ah, is what you said. Just in the house. You know, like if you were looking at... Um, even a dog or whatever. And I think within, with human beings, I think it is the same thing too, where you have, um, you know, self-preservation is by far. Oh, Justin is here. Hi, Hi Justin. Guys. Good morning, Hi. Justin. Hi, good morning, everyone. Good Hi. Good morning, Justin. Good to see you. Thank you, you too. How's, how's the weather? The weather? Colder. Oh, there's some sun here, but it's pretty cold. Wow. Yeah. How are you Apparently, guys? you guys went from hot to cold. I have family in Europe, and everybody was like, oh, uh, so, cold, so, cold, so cold, so cold, so cold. Oh, yeah. It's true. All right. Um, we, so, were, uh, we were going to, uh, or uh, the last meeting, uh, there was a, a semi-heated or a stirring debate. Arising. Uh, <laughs> it Wiesel, never, gets, Pino, and it never gets heated around here. Uh, no. it never gets heated around he here. This good. Is... Uh, we just said it's getting colder. <laughs> <laughs> and the uh, Four you... Noble Truths or something like that. Yeah, the Four Noble Truths. How wonderful. Or the truths that lead to enlightenment. Or no, maybe well, they're not even truths. And maybe, maybe they're not noble. Ennobling. For well, ennobling. Or more be, yeah. it's maybe there for people that are, are noble hearted. So let me kind of uh, set, set the stage here. Last week, uh, we discussed, uh, we discussed uh, self transcendence from uh, Maslow's perspective, the idea of uh, a peak experience versus peak being. And when I say that is, I mean, you know, I, ha I can have a peak experience here. Ooh, everything's fine. You know, I have that oceanic feeling. Everything's cool. This feels really, really good. And then on with the regular life. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to wash the car. I'm going to wash the car. I'm going to wash the car. So what's so the point? That, well, this is the question that uh, some people have, uh, have uh, asked and spent a lot of time thinking about uh, uh, the... Uh, can we, do we have peak experiences? I can say I have, I have had peak experiences. Uh, what is a peak experience? A peak, peak, uh, peak experience is a, an ineffable, ineffable, indescribable feeling of peace, that everything is cool, everything is fine. The world is as it should be, no matter what that this uh, super connection with uh, being the whole universe etc cetera, etc cetera. A, a, a sense a sense of a sense of uh, sig significance a sense of importance a sense of aplomb a sense of poise 
steadiness, that, 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 balance, that, equilibrium. Do composure. ants have peak experiences? Do Who? ants ants have peak experiences? Or is it it's only always a the same question. Thing? We don't know because we can't talk to them. So, but you we know, can talk among humans. Have you had a peak experience, Heido, Justin? And, no. and you, David, have you ever felt a moment where all of a sudden it was like that aha moment, a eureka moment where like, oh my, this is it. Oh my, this feels so good. I feel so, so, so great. What Not about happy. a feeling that, that I understand a lesson like, and I feel good about right, it? Right, right, right. Is it's, that one? Yes. Yeah, it can happen when you are looking at the sunset or the sunrise or you're riding a bicycle in nature. Typically, it happens in natural environments. Think about it. That, that's, a, you know? that's, a, that's a normal thing that happens to people throughout their life as to so, yes. coming yes. to understand. Why so, could yes. it happen to animals? Okay. They have but we're not going to go there, Heido, because, you know, we don't know. So we're right. going to be speculating whether uh, mosquitoes have a sense of uh, uh, plenitude, you know, when they're, no. So, but you, you just said it yourself, David, that this is a natural thing. This is a right. natural thing that we have every so often. It's like a door opens and we're looking at the whole universe going like, ah, oh, boom, and it hits us like as, a ton of bricks. As we were talking before about the instincts, to me, this here is a natural instinct of preservation. It happens to people when they all of a sudden come to realize something exists and whether it's right or wrong or whatever it may be, you know, just like last week, you, what got us, what got me here today was your little video from last week, because I told you before last week that, you know, I'd really gotten tired of the, um, what is it? The Eastern the philosophies. Eastern <laughs> philosophies, yeah. Down me, I, I mean, to, quite frankly, to me, I find the Eastern philosophy just a different way of looking at uh, Christianity. Uh, to me, they're identical. In a way, yes. only, only different words. I mean, the thing is, that's all it is. And the center between Christianity, Judaism, and Buddhism, and all these is what you say is suffering, you know? Well, the thing is, I think there's another aspect of life, too, uh, that is there, that is experiencing life. And these moments that you're talking about is where that comes in. When, so, uh, and those are learning experiences. You so, know? Justin, you were going to say something, but I was going to add on to what he's just saying right now, because okay, this is setting sure. the conversation beautifully. Go ahead. Uh, well, I was going to offer three qualifications. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, good, good. Okay. So the three qualifications I might offer. Um, so first, peak experience being relative. A peak is relative to something the trough. that's not a peak. Yeah. Yeah, it could be a trough or it could be a, a, an equilibrium. Yeah. Um, so um, let's say if someone is totally blissed out all the time, that's not a peak experience because it's just their noise, let's say. So I, just one, one thing, okay, so it's, uh, it's relative. Uh, another thing I'd say we're talking specifically about affective experience. Because you can be miserable and intellectually realize something that could even be profound. So it's not that kind of thing. It's not like, oh, I just realized something. Um, I'd say what people mean when they talk about peak experience is a, is a very uh, clear qualitative affective change in their uh, experience. Uh, and there's a third. Yeah, so making sense so far. You're yeah, saying the same thing that that, uh, that uh, Louis said. No, but okay. you're saying that that you could have a, a realization, but, but be uh, uh, <laughs> depressed or something, or yeah, like, well, I mean, it you could, could realize something that you feel is very profound, but if so, your if that doesn't change, if that doesn't have a radical change to your affective experience in that moment, then that's so, not, that's something other than what's being called a peak experience. So if a, a person uh, was uh, given the f uh, four noble truths and they say, oh, I, I get it. Yeah, that's then, not a peak but, experience. But, but they, if, if they get it, but it, it won't necessarily change their, uh, it won't pull them out of depression or anything. 
Yeah, that's not a peak experience. That's mm. a, maybe an intellectual realization. Um, and then the third thing I would say. Wait a second, I got a question. Okay, called cool. an intellectual realization. Yeah. What's the difference between what he's talking about and an intellectual realization? Because they're both the same. So an intellectual realization is what Cairo was maybe just mentioning. Is that what you mean by the same? Yeah, it, it, to me, this it's all the same because. Yeah, then, now that's know. not a peak experience because. Uh, why isn't it? Uh, because uh, what when people talk about peak experience, they're, they're, it's not saying that uh, an intellectual realization is not important or not significant. It's not saying that. It's just a different category so, uh, than the peak experience. So let's say, for example, if you, uh, if you are, I know, sitting there and then all of a sudden, all of your worry completely disintegrates and you feel completely at one. You might feel so much at one that you never even imagined such a feeling was possible. This could be categorized as a peak experience. Or if you feel overwhelming love for everything in the entire universe, then that could be uh, another kind of peak experience. But that's affective, that's it. That's feeling based, you see. Could it be induced by a drug or alcohol? Yeah, um, I'm not sure if I've heard of people having it induced by alcohol, but I certainly heard of many such things. Uh, okay. LSD? Drugs. But then we might have to argue, let's say, for example, if you take MDMA and you feel love for everything, is that a peak experience? Some people might argue, well, no, because it's drug induced and therefore we'll classify it differently. But in another sense, uh, Maybe it's not so dissimilar. What, what is the third one? The I third one is that there is not, it's not like, oh, um, there is one kind of peak experience and with peak experience, you, you feel like this. It's not like that. There are many different kinds of peak experience. And I mentioned last time, the Peak States Institute, they do very fascinating work and they, um, really try to study and categorize the different types of peak experience. Many different religions and, and also non-religions uh, talk about different profound experiences they can have. And some people would assume, oh, they're all talking about the same thing. And it seems like actually they're not. So uh, there is, um, for example, people might talk about quiet mind, where the mind totally settles. There's no discursive thought anymore. And there's great peace. Whereas some, there may be other experiences which are characterized by overwhelming love, which may not, uh, you know, somebody whose mind has gone totally quiet and tranquil may not experience overwhelming love. Uh, so that's just two, two examples. But there is maybe many different uh, types. Uh, so, yeah, just to say it's not we're not always talking about the same thing if we talk about peak experience. Like there's many different types. Well, the only thing I got to say to me, you know, is the thing is I look for simplicity and understanding life. Right. And the thing is when people take and come out with all these different categories and all these different things, there yeah. is no simplicity in that. The thing is all that is, is a cognizant mm -hmm. understanding of whoever is teaching whatever particular thing may be. You may have the same thing in, like they say, each of the different religions. Uh, including Buddhism or whatever it may be. But the thing is, the reality of it is, it only means and only is relative and happens and is able to be explained within side of a narrow, very narrow group. Um, you know, so, you know, the thing is, when you're trying to explain something, like even the difference between, you know, a peak, whatever, and what Luis had said before, to me, they're the same thing. And trying to take and dissect them in different languages and different categories. I mean, obviously you can do that. And that's unfortunately what our psychiatry does today. And that's why we have so many different problems because people go off in so many different areas and nobody can think the same. You know, it's really sort of insane to me. Let's take tacos and fish and chips. Like fish and chips are famously popular in England. I, I haven't eaten fish and chips in a very long time. 
but just as an archetypal famous English dish, right? Yes, yes. And then a Mexican might say, what are you talking about? That's just, you're talking about something that's just for a specific group. Like I have no experience of fish and chips. Uh, surely you're talking about tacos. You must be talking about tacos. I uh, don't say that. That don't happen. <laughs> yeah, you but know, the thing is- you're, create, you're creating something, you're creating a picture of something that's non-existent. That's, well, yeah. No, no, like fish it. and chips does exist. We have it in England. And no, so do tacos. Exists. No, that's yeah, not true. Because... Food, food is diverse. It's not like, oh, you're just making it overcomplicated to say there are these different kinds of food. No, no, there are these different kinds of food. And I'm people have experienced that. fish and chips and people have experienced tacos. Uh, All right. And it's possible for a Mexican to eat fish and chips also. Yeah. yeah, I know that. So, Just, they like it or not. I mean, everybody grows up with whatever they're accustomed to. You exactly. Know, and then some people the can't easily imagine something that they haven't experienced. Right, it right. It doesn't right. mean that that's it's a, overcomplicated. That's, that is a very important point, Justin. Because, you know, we talk here, we come and talk about the vulnerable truths and, you know, states of uh, peak experience or, you know, being a peak experience. Yeah. People are looking at us like, what? What the heck are you talking about? Yeah, yeah. What what yeah, is this the all? Thing is, the, th exactly. the thing is, so, Louise, everybody's going to relate to it the way that they understand right, the right. word. I mean, sure, and, and everyone will relate yeah. to different dishes that they've already That's heard right. about. And we ways. all come in here from different perspectives, different right. uh, tra traditions, different histories, different situations, different factors. All we're doing here is trying to have a uh, somehow a conversation, sharing ideas. Right. of on a subject on a specific subject of interest at least uh you know to me it is a subject of interest i've been spending 20 years on that i know so You've done a good job uh, i mean you know uh so let's talk a little bit of, of, about peak experience versus peak being right, you know right. uh, and let, let's break down what you were saying about the three aspects the three mm -hmm. factors which are very important very important. Just, just before we do that, may I just, I, yes. I want to try to bring David in a little closer, if possible. David, have you ever uh, been in the early stages of, of falling in love with someone um, where the world felt different? Like things that you would, that would normally irritate you didn't, for example? Nothing bother you. Well, not, not, not even the rain, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is, the way I look, the way I look at, the, at what you're proposing is that everybody goes through different stages of life. And the thing is, the relationships with other, with women or with sex or whatever, yes. is something that happens during a certain age in life, period. And, you know, that's the way it is. And you, every, I'm not saying everybody experiences the same experiences, sure. but the thing is, like, we were just talking about instincts. And I think that sex is one of the major instincts underneath of um, self-preservation. Right. With that, everybody experiences a sexual relationship with others in their own way. Yep. And in doing sure. so, and in doing so, their experiences are somewhat different um, as to what they would actually feel uh, based upon their prior um, experiences yeah. in life. Sure. But yeah. what, what, what was the question that I asked you? Does, does that have you ever felt in that way that I don't know that during some stage of falling in love that you've uh, like I say that things that would normally maybe irritate you don't at all and that you you kind of like that the world feels like a better place does that relate to you at all it might not it's okay and it's not no the thing is what you like said that. does relate to me very much so but it okay. relates to me in a way of understanding um, and I'm a word guy. I get into words and try to understand words because I feel that people, when they speak, uh, speak words, but half the time they don't know what they're saying. True, and true. But I'm is, asking you about your experience. I'm not asking you about your understanding. I'm asking you, in your direct experience, have you ever had that kind of sense that, like I said, things that would normally irritate you don't, you know, particularly in, in a case of, in the context of, falling in love. Have you ever had that kind of experience yourself? I, I'm not understanding exactly what you're saying. Okay, I'll, well, maybe I'll give an example. Like uh, maybe one time when I was uh, really feeling in love with someone, um, you know, I could walk outside and everything looks more beautiful than it did in, in the months before. 
the trees look more beautiful. Uh, all the people seem more beautiful. Everything seems very satisfying. Uh, almost nothing would irritate me. Uh, have you ever felt similar to that? That would be unusual for your normal life. Uh, well, yeah, that, that happens once, once again. It happened to me when I was younger and was, uh, you know, in that stage of, you know, sexual attraction, you might call yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. And it really, it puts a person into that, you know, I mean, that right. okay, it, it's something that does happen. But I mean, it's, exactly. the, the thing is, yeah. what happens is people get caught up into that. And that emotion oh. ends up uh, taking and controlling their life. Yeah, you know, so we could, yeah, we could have that conversation. But I think w what is relevant to me is that uh, you've had a direct experience of a shift in perception. Of, I'm not saying it's necessarily a peak experience, but it's uh, the, the, um, it's a kind of perceptual shift that is uh, very much involving affect and the way we feel the way we feel perhaps about ourselves and about the world. Yeah, but that's think, what you do when you're young. I mean, when people are young, they operate on emotion. They don't operate on common sense. Some people who are not young also maybe uh, All right. suddenly get blown away by a woman. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so good questions, good answers. This is all good to re uh, again, focus properly on this discussion that we're having, which we're gonna take to unfortunately to an Eastern philosophical idea uh -huh. Which, which is actually a psychotherapy, a human psychotherapy. Psychotherapy and it's been, is mind therapy through words. Yes, okay, mind therapy. So Not it's a words. mind therapy, which, you know, because we all want to be happy. We all want to survive, but we don't want to be surviving unhappy. We want to, we want to survive and be happy while we are surviving. So these three factors that you were talking about, Justin, are yeah. very well put. To the to the discussion because what you are what you are trying to do is just how how do I define properly how do I describe properly a peak experience mm -hmm. and then I'm going to take it further and ask the question can we have and this is I'm I'm just uh, following the the steps of uh, 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 Colin Wilson who asked the question of Maslow who at the time thought nah this peak experience is something we experience every so often. And he said, nah, I don't know about that. There must be a way to continue, you know, have that you know, peak being constantly feeling in love. Nothing bothers you. It's an overwhelming, you know, you're describing, you're describing that it has to be integral. It cannot be intellectual only. It has to be intellectual, effective, uh, spiritual. I would say it doesn't have to be intellectual. I would say there could be an intellectual component but it, I, I'd say I, fundamentally, I'm going to take this. I'm going to take this, experience. and I'm going to I'm going to propose that it is comprehensive, holistic, and integral. Okay. It it affects your your uh, PFC, your prefrontal cortex, your mammalian, your reptilian, everything. It it takes the whole being. Hence, it is intellectual, rational, logical, affective, uh, sentimental. Uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's a whole being experience. It, it, you cannot say, well, it, I, I think I I'm making this up. When you say it, you're not talking about one thing, but you're still talking about a broad category of experiences. Well, we're going to first try to define what is a peak experience. Yeah, and a yeah. peak experience is an overwhelming, integral, holistic, okay. ineffable, indescribable experience okay. of reality by itself. Think about it, because that's when you you know you're outside of yourself. You it's not me in the world. That it's beyond that. And the moment that there is a distinction, there is no peak experience. <laughs> Any duality just breaks the breaks the spell. So I'm trying to get to that idea of what is a peak experience. Number one. Number two. Can we become a peak experience full time? while the light bulb is, is on. That means that as long as that light, that uh, uh, reality is looking at itself through that light bulb that is on, and I contend that, it, you know, we have to kind of see the evolution of a peak experience from infancy up to death. Because, you know- The infancy of the experience up to death of the experience? No, no, a child, the, a child, a child, a baby, oh, a baby, you know. Yeah. 
see, can you, is a baby feeling peak experience? He's very happy. No worries. No dukkha. Okay. No nothing. Oh, no, every no, so no, no, often. No, no. Every, a baby every so having often. a dukkha. Oh my God. Yeah. They have so much dukkha. Yeah, of course they have dukkha. They, they have a rash in their bottom. They are hungry. They're too cold or this. They, blah, blah, blah. But that is at the, 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 the level. And we're not talking about, you know, if you ask a child about a peak experience, it's like asking a mosquito about a peak experience. Hey, what do you think about a peak uh, experience? Uh, what the hell are you talking about? So, but it's very important in any mindfulness exercise, which is this is a mindfulness exercise paying attention to something, meditating on an object, mental object, and going through it until, you know, the full understanding uh, arises, you become one with the object. And in this case, we're trying to become one with the very notion of a peak experience. What is it? And those three things you just said, lay the grounds for saying, okay, is it something that is emotional only? but not intellectual, not rational, not complete perception, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And I contend, because it is a peak experience, it has to be overwhelmingly integral to the being itself. And that includes emotions, sensations, dopamine, serotonin, it's it from the from the cellular level, actually from the atomic level all the way to the infinity. That is the peak experience, it takes everything, every, every, it, you have to muster every knowing, whether it is emotional, uh, uh, you know, the ideas of love, compassion, uh, feeling, connection, et cetera, et cetera. So a peak experience is holistic, integral, ineffable. It is overwhelming. It is absolutely transcending and transcendent. No, you have no worries at that moment. Everything is perfect. So there is no dukkha. That's the almost the, <clears throat> the peak experience can be almost the how it feels to be enlightened. The moment of enlightenment of the, of, of the Buddha. So how can you be enlightened one second and not enlightened the next one? So how do you replicate that intentionally? It has to be intentional. It has to be, uh, you have to stay on it. You have to stay focused. How do you mindfully bring the mind to that moment, that peak experience and make it a state? Like you said the other day, we a state argue, of uh, being. It's a natural state. A natural state. It's not natural, but it's not natural because uh, if it were natural, everybody would be. It depends a, it, what we mean by natural. Uh, if we don't, if what we don't mean by natural is common. <laughs> then good. Okay. So yes, your reality is one hundred percent natural. So any peak experience within reality, arising from reality, emerging from reality, is natural. I agree with you. There's no supernatural. The sense of natural. Yeah, no uh, supernatural. It's yeah. not supernatural because there's nothing supernatural. Because well, some, some would argue that if you rest in the the nature of mind, you know, then the, the nature of mind itself is perfect. So I agree with in you. In this I sense agree with of natural, you. maybe uh, the the, the if, one if you method say that, maybe yeah. to merely uh, destroy or remove all right. of the obstacles yeah. between your present state and your natural state. And it's so, well, it is, it is just as natural to be uh, in samsara as it is to be in Nibbana, it's natural states. But what is more usual? What is more probable? Well, if you look around, the numbers are gonna tell you. It is more probable to be in samsara than to be in Nirvana or Nibbana yeah. or in peak, peak state, yeah. peak being. And we so, could say confusion. If, uh, if some sort of uh, David's up there somewhere, but if David doesn't like the word samsara, we could use the word yeah. confusion. Anyway, so do we agree on the, the notion of the definition or the, the nature of a peak experience? And now can we, uh, can we agree that it could be a state and, and how could it be a state? 
Well, so we're going to take the Four Noble Truths, which is the same exercise, which is saying life is not a peak state. Can, uh, Luis, <laughs> can, can you, uh, I'm not sure you, uh, you defined peak experience uh, or, or can you give examples of peak experience and would it include uh, things that, that Christians uh, feel when they go to a Pentecostal church and they're, and they're going like this and maybe they, they get elated and because they're together and happy yeah. and singing or like, like when, when Jesus, uh, when, when after Jesus, uh, passed away and and then he came back in spirit and 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 his uh, disciples were together and they felt the holy spirit entered them somehow and did they have was that a peak experience or what about mystical experiences of, of christian saints yeah i i know where you experiences? go with this and, and i can i don't i don't know because a peak experience is a personal thing it's so maybe like, you your know. peak experience is, is individual unique and so like justin says that there's a yeah. variety of, of peak experiences like that book a variety yeah. of religious experiences well uh yes uh yeah. again but reality yeah. looks at itself one mind at a time so you decide and so you maybe, know i take I, I i take you back to the kalama sutra who who that you know the the teacher sets the pace right there hey you decide it's up to you why do you want to call a peak experience and where does that get you so it's a personal investigation into the nature of being and that, that has to be done one, but one it sounds time. like you're defining it, it sounds like yeah. you, you defined it as including intellectual like it, that's a one component it has to be there but yeah. but falling yeah. in love is maybe it's not so intellectual so maybe uh, it, to, to me <clears throat> one thing that i have you know, in my, in my worldview, these, these things that I do are the result of looking at everything from a super perspective consilience. You cannot understand something only from one perspective. Like you cannot understand love from the fact that uh, all of a sudden the traffic lights don't bother you. It has to be a little bit deeper than that. So in, when I look at reality, now I look at, at everything in, in terms of not to. Very Advaitan, uh, very holistic. Everything is interrelated. So a peak experience or samsaric experience is interrelated. And it has to do with affect, hormones, environment, history, your education, the culture you live in. Uh, uh, what you know, what you don't know, your intentions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Every mind is the whole world right there, looking you, at itself. What do you mean by so, samsaric experience? Is, is that the same? Samsaric as a, experience yeah. is a, a human experience that is uh, stressful, oh. or you, you feel pain. That's, that's it. Oh. And nirvanic experience is a human experience where you don't feel pain. So you are in a peak. Can I qualify that as emotional pain? not physical pain. For example, the Buddha felt physical pain, but we don't class him as having Buddha. See, emotional and intellectual or rational or logical are aspects of the same thing. But I was differentiating that from physical. So it's sense pain, sensory pain, or homeostatic it, yeah. pain. Yeah, a hammer on your, yeah. A, a not, hammer on you. At least yes. in the Buddhist sense, we don't call that, So if you go uh, deep uh, into yeah. the, the idea of pain, you include everything. The physical pain, the fear, anxiety, uh, uh, doubt, sloth. You know, they, they kind of break it down in all its aspects. But at the end of the day, it's either you, you can kind of subcategorize everything or you can just kind of, uh, like the yin and the yang, right? So the yin... You could say the white is good and the black is bad, or the white is smart and the black is dumb. The white is non-feeling and the black is feeling. All kinds of dualities and differentiations. But in my world perspective, in my worldview, I see everything. Actually, I don't see everything. I see through everything. Let's put it this way. So and that's one of the one of the, the tricks to transcend 
samsara. Because you can't get out of it until you die anyway. So you kind of have to trick yourself. The mind has to kind of get out of itself. The dipole of eros and tanatos, you know, the attraction and repulsion. It Stepping out of it is in reality a very non-substantive abstract idea. The mind just ejects itself from, from itself because the mind is, you know, the, uh, I, I was looking, at, I was listening to Alan Watts that says that the trap and the trapped are one. <laughs> the mind traps itself and, and wants to free itself from itself. That's why I say that the Kula Sunyata where, where at the end of that uh, sutra on emptiness, the mind looks at itself and goes, I am the trap. Okay, I'm done. So it, the, the peak experience is a preview, an instinct, like you said, you started the conversation yourself, David, by asking this very question. What is the most basic instinct of the human being? Self-preservation? Well, we can take it even further. We want to live and we want to be happy too. We're not stupid. So for the most part, you know, people don't want to suffer. So the most basic instinct is to get out of our mind because although we don't know it, we are the trap. The instinct is survival. It's not to get out of your mind. Most people don't know how to get out of their mind or what. I, very difficult, right? How do I get out of myself? Go ahead and try that sitting yeah, down and, and look. So we, we get to this idea that the peak experience is a preview in, into the peak being. And the peak being is the mind escaping its own trap, itself. Because yeah, so without a mind, there is no suffering. I'm not sure I follow about this escaping oneself or getting out of the Okay, mind. all right. Uh, so so let's, let's put it this way. Let's imagine the, the, the whole universe, the whole cosmos and multiverses or whatever, because it, yeah. it goes on and on and on. The bulk, the scientists call it the bulk, a series of infinite slices of cosmic bubbles okay. at infinity, because the bulk is infinite and eternal. But just imagine the whole shebang wanga, the whole tortilla enchilada, yeah. where there is no self-awareness anywhere. There is no one, nowhere, not even the bulk itself, yeah. stops okay. and ponders and goes, what the hell is going on here? Where do I come from? Who, I, who am I, right? It's not existent. Because, we, because when we ask ourselves this question, this is the universe asking itself the question. How do I work? What am I? Who am I? Where am I going? Where do I come from? So just imagine for a second that in the whole of the universe, the whole of reality with a big capital R, no one or no process, no organismic process, no system, no computer, no nothing, no bundle of energy is asking this question. What the hell is going on here? Without that question, there is not even a trap. There is no mind. There is no trap. There is no suffering. There is no happiness. There is no great. relative. There is no relative and no no knowing. There is no knowing. Are you saying that animals ask that question? I d I'm not saying that. But animals have. No, no, no. Suffering. I'm asking whether reality itself, the whole, yeah. where all the animals crawl around. Yeah, yeah. In the whole confines of the whole bulk, yeah. does it ask the question itself? If there are no animals, no thing. And in but, that uh, being the case, is there any suffering or any uh, idea of nirvana? But this question is just a mundane human question. It's like, uh, does the universe make fish and chips if there is no humans? Well, no, because it's just a, a very mundane human thing to do is make fish and chips. And I would okay. say it's a very mundane human okay. thing to ask this question also. Is in reality, a sense, in a sense. Okay. Is reality beyond any question? Monday. Well, questions are also are just humans. It's like a, it's like a, just imagine a, an advanced alien looking at humans and say, "Oh, yeah, they make questions. How amusing!" What, I, what I'm asking here is that if there were no questions, yeah, in the whole universe, yeah, what would happen? Would uh, the whole universe be in a peak being? <laughs> Can you consider that a big being? 
questions are just, uh, I would, maybe David, would you agree that questions are an adaptive function uh, that have come as an evolutionary process in the, uh, in the project of, um, well, partially uh, self-survival and so on. I would add some other aspects to merely saying that life is focused around survival, but David, what would you think? You know, why, why are there questions? Would you see this as an adaptive evolutionary strategy? Questions happen because people are curious to know what's around them. Especially like Louise just said, the center of everything evolves into the individual wanting to know and understand why they are there, period, wherever there <laughs> might be. Why? That's what it's all, that's what it's but, all about. But, but but thing let, let's make this question easier. Uh, There's nobody in the universe. Imagine a universe with nobody in it, okay? Humans, just to, or, yeah, but these are utopian no, thoughts. No, 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 no thinking, no question Can so there is animals and so on there's nothing animals don't nothing but rocks I mean, thinking Let's, is it, a prefrontal cortex uh, they well, quite well, late evolution yeah but, but i could say maybe rocks think and we don't know it so let's let's say that there's a universe where there's nothing no mind maybe no sentient beings is that what you mean? there you go no sentience okay no sentience. so now okay that's so is is that is that number one is that possible and what happens? What are the consequences of no mind, uh, a mindless universe? Well, I personally, oh, sorry, David. I was going to say the thing is, you, you know, the, the whole thing, you know, you can't, we wouldn't even be talking here about anything without words. And words are the primary source of understanding, period. Because if you don't understand the words that you're speaking or the words that have been come down through history and have evolved into what they are, period. I mean, you, you're just, your mind is just going with words into some kind of utopian thing that you have no idea what's going on, period. And th that's the way I look at it. So the source of all things evolve around words. And the thing is words or sounds, whether you speak Spanish or Hungarian right. or whatever. Each imagine, imagine our universe without mouth. Hence, without words. But I really disagree that so, words are the primary way of uh, knowing. So the David world. is saying that that in the beginning was the word. So it was even here before the universe. So there no. had to be a, a word, and there had to be a question before the universe. Yes, yeah, so, there was a mind before so, the universe. There was a mind. <laughs> words for like a few hundred thousand years. A mind oh, questioned. I, I, the I'm trying to question that. I know. I'm, I'm trying to say, imagine a universe without mind is that possible according to david and and christian uh theology probably it's it's not possible because in the beginning was the word i'm not asking about theology i'm, I'm asking you Jairo. <laughs> i'm asking you oh, let me put the question in another way if the universe is a zero and a one right because that's what the universe is a zero becoming one and a one becoming zero and then uh, you, you you mix that twice, three times, blah, 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 and then you get a molecule, and then you get blah, 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 you get the whole universe in there. But actually, at the end of the day, the universe is zero becoming one, and one becoming zero at infinity and eternity. So where is the mind? Is it in the one, or is it in the zero? Or is it in both? Your mind is in the words you just spoke. <laughs> <laughs> at least I'm not mindless. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, I kind of want to say two things. If I could. Well, so one, one is to answer your question, Luis, but I'll do that second if I may. The, the first is to, to um, address what you said, David. So I'd say like about the, the thought that we know the world through words, that's like the primary way of knowing. I severely disagree with that. And I'd say words have been around for what? Maximum few hundred thousand years. For example, a dog has many ways of knowing the world, none of which are through words. Uh, a dog, uh, the, the sense of smell for a dog is so intense. The dog, a dog can know so much through its nose. Um, and Does he know so, that he knows? 
he knows knows. Does he know? Does he know that he knows? <laughs> but it depends what you mean by that. It totally oh, depends, like how you define. Oh, David! That David, uh, David means that that a word is is not just uh, what you find in the dictionary. A word is vibration. So what? sense of smell is a vibration. So that is a word also. So a dog does use words. The whole reality is a vibration. But if that is what's meant, then I have a different. Uh, on this, uh, different in my mind, no. the definition of well, word is somewhat different than that. I'm, but I, all right. I'm putting ideas into David. What do you think, we, David? Okay, I think yep. that I started out with before with my question about instincts. Okay, and what I told you and said to you is my experiences, even with a roach or the smallest bug or whatever, you try to kill it, and it runs away and hides. It is right. reaching self preservation. And the thing is, I find this to be true within all animals and insects, period. And especially you take a dog, for example, you're talking about dogs, they have a super ability to smell and do different right. things. And they have their own language that they are able to communicate that to other people of what their abilities actually are. This emotion is, based. Huh? Emotion based. I'd say they're uh, Whatever you want to take it in, I mean, the thing is, a dog, if they've gone to you know, some horrible experiences, you can see that in their personality before you get them. And you see that through the emotional connection, through the emotional communication. And I think that's, they're inhabiting a primarily affective experiential world. Whereas the humans with our very sophisticated prefrontal cortex, we have the cognitive function in no. which we have language and so on. And that's where words come in. But, but more fundamental to all that word stuff is actually the emotional experience. Well, the thing is, the dog, I mean, the thing is, people have words. Words were only mm -hmm. documented maybe 2,000 years ago to the point that we what? can carry them forward. We're two or 3,000 years, it's not been that long to where this actually been written down, where we have record of things from the past, whatever language you may go into. And the thing is, because of these written words, what it does, it offers people to take those words and mm -hmm. to distort them from their original author and their original intention to make them into anything that they want them to be. No other animal on the face of this earth has that ability. There are some places even in the Indian Ocean where there's an island out there that these people are, are, are natives to that island that don't even speak any normal language that still exists. And these people, they get along fine living their life doing whatever they do i mean the thing is the only problem that we have is what we do with words and how we take and interpret them and how we look at the world and use them but once again you go back to the instinct of self-preservation and that's exactly what people will do is use words that they're familiar with for their own self-preservation just one 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 point there if a word is putting your hand on a rock and painting it, we go back to 40,000 years, just uh, That's just not a word, that's an action. Actions existed from the time of being. Uh, uh, painting, being. Painting, painting a deer or painting a, a bear or painting a, a uh, man. Is that a that's word? An, that's no. an action creating a, a symbol. It's not a word. Something, you know? A word, is a word a symbol? That, yes, it does. It represents a symbol. It represents then then a handprint on a rock is a symbol. Right, that's true. But the only thing is, they didn't put them in, in strong sentences and write, you know, different poems. They were. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, we, we on have, a rock. We have, we, 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 even important. now, we have uh, huge, really, really lengthy epics that were preserved in oral traditions thousands of years before the advent yeah. of writing. So, uh, I think we've been. <laughs> I, I, it was just a it was just a, a, a perspective i mean the language the, the 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 ability to transmit and share ideas which is language whether you, i look yeah, at you language. and i give you a sign like this uh language is much older than two or three thousand or five thousand or ten hundreds of thousands of years at least well i, I, I was just a that was just a a note, yeah. side note but the only thing is documented words to record them to use them in a political sense it's not it's not been around that long Since i mean farming. Actually not that long well, thousand years or writing arose years. from farming because we had to uh record surplus so a massive shift in human culture came when we transitioned from being hunter-gatherers to agriculture guys and that's when we, 
Oh yeah, that's a different. I'm, I'm sorry because we have completely deviated from the 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 subject. Right. Just like in a good meditation, you wanna you wanna meditate on compassion, and you end up thinking about the mosquito that's gonna bite you. Right. Uh, and this is awesome. this is the typical case of the mind that is uh, uh, ADHD. We 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 wanted to talk about peak experiences, define it, and then try to propose the idea that a, a, a mind can be a peak experience and what does it consist in, what, what are the prerequisites or the discipline that the mind must have. And then we were going to uh, combine that with the, the Four Normal Truths. Okay, uh, I'm, which, okay I, I got some things I have to do, so I'll see you maybe next week. All right, David, always okay. good to see you. See you there. So, I'm going to give myself a few more minutes, but uh, the the so maybe we cannot talk about the four normal truths, or maybe we should talk about the four normal truths and forget about peak experience, because by the study of the four normal truths, we may be able to get a get a glimpse of what the peak experience is, and then how it becomes a peak being. Sure. So maybe we should we should start. Again, well, I, well, maybe I can over. ask. Maybe I can ask because I think that we have uh, the the cluster of meaning which the term peak experience is pointing to in your mind and in my mind is different. It's maybe overlapping, but different. Uh, of course, I think that's the same with every word. Yeah, we, here we're trying to co uh, find a, a co cohesion of, of thinking. We're trying to find points in common to see if yeah. we can build on each other yeah. to arrive to So I have a, a suggestion. Um, if you are talking about the specific uh, peak state or whatever we want to call it, that, that we, as Buddhists we would call enlightenment, we could just talk about uh use use the term enlightenment rather than peak experience if that if, if if that's the experience that you are referring to if you if you're if you're referring not only to enlightenment but up various other categories of experience various other various other states let's say yeah. not only enlightenment but other other states then then i would say let's carry on with the, the word peak experience uh, peak state or peak experience whatever but it's, it's, a, it's specifically only talking about enlightenment. Let's just yeah. use that word, enlightenment. Well, it, it's a, it's a very good point, you know, because when you look at anything, you have to look at it from different perspectives to understand it properly. Sure. Uh, peak experience is a psychological experience, isn't it? I'd say many different uh, experiences. <laughs> it's no, of the mind. That's my point. But it's of the mind, by the mind, through the mind. You know, about I'd say it's not it. I, that, that's why I kind of, it's like, it, at least the way, the way I use the term and the way I uh, read the term in certain contexts, there's no it. There is many peak, many different kinds of peak experience. And I, if we're still talking about a diverse right. range of experiences, then that's okay. cool. But if okay. you're, it, sometimes me... it sounds to me like you're talking about one specific one, in which case... Okay. How, yeah, how many realities are there? How many realities are there? Well, how many realities with a big R? How many universes are there? How many realities are there? One, two, five, fifteen? Um, it's difficult for me to answer that. I would have to contemplate that. I'm not sure I'm capable of answering that. If I were forced, I, I would probably I propose, say one. But, I propose uh, I yes. I, I propose there is a one reality, which okay. consists of being and non-being, right. <laughs> and then okay. there are myriads of ways that that reality can look at itself. Okay. So, so the absolute is, and then it looks at itself in many different ways. So, okay. peak experiences would be all the perspectives put together so the reality can see itself clearly. Absolutely. That's clear. a, oh, yeah. Okay. So then there's only one. There. So what we could yeah. say is if there is one reality, yeah. there is 
there is uh, what is the way through which reality can experience itself directly without any filter, any relativity. See? So, so in that way, it would be the same for everyone to experience it. it would be that's same, right. right. So yeah. either, either you, you make a perspective absolute, like reality, one, which is very difficult because you have to be everywhere and have all the experiences and all the histories and all the blah, 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 blah together. Or you take all the different perspectives, which are infinite, and then you create a super perspective, a transcendent perspective, which transcends them all to get to the transcending, which is reality itself. You see where I'm going with this? So the peak experience would be reality experiencing itself, being yeah. fully, wholly, right? Mm -hmm. uh, through an infinity of perspectives. <laughs> at once? Because all anything, once. all at once, in every way. Right, right, yeah. So we definitely have a different, uh, right. uh, we're holding a different meaning of the term peak experience. So yes. but would, would, would the word enlightenment or, uh, I mean, what, what phrase that is coming from is like seeing reality as it is, which is a phrase that I would, ex would associate with uh, enlightenment. Well, I can call it peak experience. I can call it enlightenment. I can call it, uh, I can call it uh, the rabbit hole going through, you know, the, the wormhole through which reality yeah. sees itself in over and over and over again at infinity. So to me, what I've been looking at and lately experiencing is this oneness of reality <coughs> with itself. Right. And, and of course, if there is one reality, that reality is absolute. But how it looks at itself is necessarily uh, relative. So the absolute and the relative, another yin-yang, they are together. They're the same thing. I always say that the observed reality, the observer, the mind, no matter what mind it is, the, uh, yeah. uh, with the sentience, yeah. and the very act, the very process yeah. of scenting, scenting, are the same thing. They would have to be. Otherwise, we'd have to say right. that mind is not real. So, it's if, not a part of reality. So what enlightenment is looking at or looking for is the cessation of suffering. Doubt, non-understanding, alienation, separation, the sense of duality, you know, the sense of distinction. How does the absolute, which doesn't think for itself, doesn't have a mind of itself, if he has a mind, it's because it came out of it. A mind is off reality. It emerges from reality, you know, but, and it looks at itself. So reality the whole looks at itself through its parts or through its aspects. You see, how does the aspect catch a glimpse of that and go, oh, okay, I can see through myself. I can, I can escape my uh, relativity. <laughs> how it can like a it's mind... It seems like a third way. For huh? reality to want to escape something. And that's the only way to get out of the trap. The, tra the mind is the trap. The mind suffers because it is mind. How does it entrap itself? By seeing itself as the whole, which doesn't suffer. There's no trap in there because there's no mind. Because the mind is an aspect of it, not its essence. <laughs> the essence of anything is anicca, dukkha, and anatta. If you put those three things together, that is the key to untrap yourself. <laughs> the mind is its own trap because it thinks, because it's the relative aspect. It didn't ask to, to come out of uh, the whole. It just happens. The whole is zero becoming one, one becoming zero. The, the quantum mechanics... 
Huh? Oh, no. Well, it express. It's an expression. It's it's an aspect of it. Yeah. You don't come out of reality. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> There's no reality. Out of the hole, uh, where do they See? go? <laughs> so the only way to come out is is also in relative terms, because the mind is relative. It's not really real. It doesn't exist. It's just an aspect of the whole. <laughs> so enlightenment is the relative transcending itself into the absolute. And that's the peak experience. And, and which is, which is in, interesting is you don't die when you transcend, which is funny. You just, you're still an aspect of real until you fall apart. You know, you become another pixel. Until the mind dissolves, um, until the organismic process of sentience falls apart, then there is a way for that sentience to identify itself with the whole, which is absolute and hence not relative. And that identification, that becoming one with yoga, is the escape door of the trap of the mind. And that is a peak experience. When you get to that, it cannot be a, a part-time. Once you get it, you cannot not get it. <laughs> but, but when you're in that, in that got it state and then you hit your toe with a hammer, there's, there's a tough do you pain. See, what you happens see, there? You see that as anicca, dukkha, and anatta. Another aspect, Will it, but uh, it doesn't take away? away from it doesn't take away from the absolute of reality. It just doesn't take anything away. It's just, you know it's just another another one zero zero one. It's it's transcendence to the very edge of madness. Because when you think like this, you are truly not thinking like a conventional human being. You are abnormal. You're outside of the norm. You are on the very extreme of uh, 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 thinking. I would, uh, I would want to again um, shift the attention away from thinking because um, it's, I would say thinking differently is not sufficient. And to take kind of take your example, if you hit your toe with a hammer, if you think differently, oh, but everything is one. It's not necessarily going to make you totally content with your throbbing toe. <laughs> um, so I would say it would be dependent on your emotional reaction. And the Buddha turned this as the, the two arrows. In fact, he, he's saying like if you get shot with an arrow, right? There is, um, well, if I yep. can paraphrase it, there is yep. the physical pain, right? Which is what you were bringing up with the hammer on the toe. Now, physical pain isn't necessarily dukkha. I'm going to get myself a coffee. Okay. Um, shall I wait? Oh, I don't know. Uh, this so is really... you, you can yeah, uh, continue. I'll carry on. But I think this is maybe a point where Lewis and I maybe disagree. So this is relevant to him too, but never mind. So um, you've got the the physical pain, right, of the arrow or the hammer. And what almost all of us do, including me, <laughs> is we add a second arrow. We stab ourselves again with the emotional reaction. Uh, and this is, you could summarize this in, in, in a certain way. You could summarize this with a non-acceptance of reality. So, uh, it's like, oh, I wish that I wasn't stabbed. <laughs> so a Buddha uh, or someone that, that is in a peak uh, being state in Nirvana, when he gets uh, hits himself with a hammer <laughs> on the toe, yeah. uh, only feels the pain, but physical. doesn't uh, put pain on top of that. Yeah, it's exactly. Like, no emotional pain. Suffering. So physical pain without emotional pain. So you can be still emotionally totally content while experiencing physical pain that's yes. the difference 
yes. usually we're like, yes. oh, this is so painful. I don't like this pain. I don't want this pain to be existing. And I, I had my like neighbor because he was playing music. Yes, yes. You know, and yep. that's so the main trouble we have. If you were to experience pain, I mean, um, I don't know if I should give a personal example. But if you I, were I to tell experience you what. pain without that, you, you wouldn't mind. I tell you what. Yeah. Enlightenment or peak being or reality looking at its being itself without uh, bias definitely transcends uh, physical pain. What do you mean by transcend? It, it's just uh, sees through it. Right. It doesn't. It's, uh, it's not that the it doesn't exist. Let, let, yeah, right. No, no. It, it, this, this is not about uh, lying or suppressing or repressing or you no. Know. Yeah. You see everything as it is, anicca, dukkha, and anatta. I mean, it's that, that simple. I, before the meeting, I wrote down these words trying to transmit the idea of a peak experience, peak being, and enlightenment. Aplomb, poise, significance, importance, steadiness, balance, equilibrium, composure, being equally weighted on either side. The dipole with pleasure and pain. That's like a kind of equanimity. And then that all those have to do with weight. Actually, when you aplomb and poise uh, and oh, balance okay. have to do with weight. So yeah, plum is from ponder, that. yeah, aplomb. Ponder is also to, to see how much it weighs. Oh, ponder right. to weigh to poise is to assess. So enlightenment or Peak experience is an assessment, a deep, ineffable assessment of reality regarding itself. The absolute looking at itself. And if you put those two things together, you'll start seeing how any assessment can be, can transcend itself. It goes beyond, it sees through phenomena and gets to the nature of everything. Because reality also, as a whole, is also anicca, dukkha, and anatta. Those three characteristics are universal. Once that has this, the, the proper view, samaditi, the proper understanding, then can get on the, onto the path and get to sila, samadhi, and panya. And the ultimate panya is an ultimate self-identification of the whole with its parts. So there's no alienation. There's no, alien no, no separation. No feeling of otherness. And right. a peak experience, for sure, is a feeling of not otherness. It's just like, I am it looking at itself. And yes, I have sore calves, or I just hit myself uh, with a with a hammer on the toe, but I'm still it looking at itself. That feeling of non-otherness can be applied any second. When you go to work, when you're talking here, when you're making coffee, taking a shower, that absolute identification of the whole with its parts and the and the part with its with the whole can it, be a, is, can it be applied to when you're on facebook and you find posts that aggravate you and you say i'm going to use perspectivism and look at it their way for a while and then look at it the other way in and, a way in a way go, no, uh, nothing bothers street, you and, and then go to the center become a so, centrist yeah. So you, you can help? say this, nothing excites you, nothing dukas you. That means that nothing bothers you and nothing pleases you. Everything goes back to the middle. So isn't that, isn't that bad in a way because it doesn't motivate you to do anything to change society? From the conventional human way of thinking, absolutely. But this is not a conventional way of, of how can you say, I am not Lewis? I am the whole of reality and I'm mean nothing it. Pleasing, yeah. Nothing 
Well, in a sense, I understand everything, but nothing attracts me or repels me because I am it. So I, there's no duality. So I am, I am everything at the same time. So there's, I, I am the absolute. <laughs> See, I am the absolute. So I don't let the, the, the tail wag the dog. So something sleepy, right? I'm sorry? Something sleepy, right? Ekagrata, like which is prefer, one-pointedness. I yeah. don't know if you take sugar in your coffee. But if you do, I'd expect you to Not in that to sense. Go. I don't take sugar in my coffee, that's for sure. Oh, okay. But I do take coffee, which is pleasing. But again, this is way beyond the pleasure and pain. So in conventional terms, yes, the coffee pleases me. But in conventional, uh, uh, trivial, mundane ways. But transcendentally, I am just beyond that. Yeah. And then the ikagrata, the poise, the poisonous, stays there right there in the middle. Nothing, nothing attracts me. Nothing repels me. I am, I am. When you think about it, mm-hmm. I am outside the dipole. I am the dipole. I am the dipole. So I'm not inside the dipole. Well. Let's put it this way. I'm inside the dipole, I'm in the streams, I'm in the middle, and I'm outside of it. Because the whole of reality has no boundaries anyway. So I, I, reality, am infinite. I'm the alpha and the omega. I'm beyond pay, pleasure and pain. So what is this about these four, uh, these four points that, that the Buddha presented in his first sermon, his first teaching, was it a prescription that his uh, four fellow mates should, if Five. they understand, or if they understand this, they would attain the peak being of the Buddha by uh, is it by by eliminating craving or or by gaining uh, wisdom or 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 eliminating ignorance? What what's more fundamental to eliminate? So- Ignorance or to eliminate craving? Everything. Again, because en- en- enlightenment is a, is a holistic thing. So you have to put everything in there and still be outside of it. So that, just imagine the mind of a Buddha that went through this exercise, destroyed his own idea of me versus reality. Because that's what we do, me and then the rest of reality. So that duality become, just is fizzled out. And then it's a guy that all of a sudden said, okay, I am the whole of reality looking at itself. I'm cool. <laughs> How can I cool, be afraid? Cool is an appropriate word. Well, like but it, I, itself means the extinguishing of fire. There's well, a lot then, of cool imagery in Buddhism. Th- so there's, th- see, I'm cool. I don't have any fires. Mm-hmm. That the eye is not on fire, the nose is not on fire, my tongue is not on fire. I still eat, I still have coffee, but my tongue is not on fire. I have, I have dispelled tanha. I drink coffee, but I'm not not thirsty for it. <laughs> huh? I am alive, but I'm not thirsty for life. I know I'm going to die, but I'm not thirsty for death. I'm completely transcendent. I am right there in the middle. I am in the middle of the whole infinity and eternity. Look at a guy like that. See how, you know, that guy yeah. feels. And how can he talk about this in five minutes to a bunch of guys out there that have been, uh, those five, st- where, where the Buddha started, which was in the opposite of, uh, in the extreme of ascetism. It was in the extreme of ascetism. Actually, these guys the Buddha, trying to understand the nature of the dipole, went, okay, I've been in the extreme of pleasure. Hey, young guy, concubines, all kinds of stuff, whatever. You know, I had everything I wanted. And still, I wasn't happy because I wanted to know what the hell was going on. Reality always asks incessantly, why, how, you know, what's the meaning of this? So the re- reality somehow, without knowing it itself, but through uh, 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 sentience, asks that question. The absolute wants to be absolute again. 
So it has to dispel all the relatives. And so imagine a guy like that. He was in the, uh, in the extreme of pleasure. And then he says, I'm not happy. I'm going to go to the extreme of pain. That's the two extremes that he talks about, you know? So he goes there and he goes to the depth of it. I mean, it was this close to annihilating its own consciousness because he was eating like one grain of uh, uh, rice uh, uh, per day. And yet, I'll be, I'll be darned, in the extremes of the dipole, he could not find the answer to the ultimate questions that reality was asking. Right? So he said, okay. So if it's not in mundane, trivial pleasure, and it's not in mundane, trivial uh, uh, suffering, it must be somewhere in a non-mundane, neither pleasure nor pain. Yeah, that guy was smart. But it must be in what? Non-mundane, non-trivial, non-pleasure, non-pain. So this is where I disagree with you. So I feel, uh, I don't, is it okay if I can? Uh, this this is a this yeah. is a discussion. I mean, of course yeah. you you you're free to disagree. The well, reality, I know, I know reality inappropriately interrupt. No, reality through that mind is asking uh, questions about what it asks itself through another mind. So I'm saying that he found uh, triviality in pleasure and triviality in pain. And I'll say something a little different. So, uh, and I know that. This is maybe not the common understanding, uh, but uh, and I know it's not the common Buddhist path today. But so far as I understand from reading the Buddhist teaching from the earliest sources, he was specifically focusing on pleasure, uh, and that was his middle path. His middle path was on pleasure, but it was on not on pleasure from the senses. So I'll read you from the Buddhist teaching. Because I see you nodding your head. Well, but, but all you have to do is read the original text if it's... Okay, if it's... I'll read it. I'll read it. I'll, I'll read it. it. It's in English, but I'll read it. I could find it in Pali. Do you have it there? Do you have it there? Yeah, yeah, I have it handy. I, I took care of it. So, uh, let me see. I'll, I'll just read from my own writing. And there's just a couple of lines before I quote. So, yeah, yeah. Um, so I've said, above we've seen how the Buddha was against emotional affect generated in response to... Now, wait a minute, yeah, wait a minute. You, you are reading somebody else's commentary on the sutra. I'm reading my own writing. Oh, okay, okay. I'm sorry. Like okay. I said, okay. it's a, uh, a couple of lines of my, my own writing, uh, follow, yes. and then a quote from the Pali Sutra. Is that okay? okay? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so uh, above we've seen how the Buddha was against... Uh, you know, I'm not going to read what was above now, it's too long, but against emotional affect generated in response to sensory affect, such as pleasure derived from eating. But was he against all emotional affect? So here is the story he recounted in the Mahasatjaka Sutta, Bodhi Jakumara Sutta and Sangharava Sutta. So we have three sources for this. Um, he had gone through the self-torture type aestheticism of the Jain religion, which you just mentioned about like, only eating one grain of rice and so on, um, but had not overcome suffering. Then he remembered an experience he had as a child. He tells this in his own voice. <laughs> right? so he's saying, I consider, I recall that when my father, the Sakyan, was occupied, while I was sitting in the cool shade of a rose apple tree, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, I entered upon and abided in the first jhana, which is accompanied by vitakka, which means initial mental application, and yep. vichara, which means sustained mental application. Yep. Uh, with rapture and pleasure born of seclusion, I can give you the Pali yep, 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 yep. Could that be the path to enlightenment? The path, not could enlightenment. That be? He's saying, <laughs> could that first jhana, characterized by rapture and pleasure, could that be the path to enlightenment? Then he continues, then 
Following on that memory came the realization. That is the path to enlightenment. Yes. So he's specifically saying that that specifically pleasurable jhana experience is the path to enlightenment. So then he continues. I thought, why am I afraid of that pleasure that has nothing to do with sensual pleasures and unwholesome states? Bravo. I thought, I am not afraid of that pleasure since it has nothing to do with sensual pleasure and unwholesome states. And Bravo. that's the key. That's why it's the middle part. It is pleasure, but nope. it's not pleasure <laughs> derived from sense yes. affect. At a pleasure, sense yes. When you start in the path, you feel less dukkha. And less dukkha is pleasurable. This is not really the absence of dukkha. I'll give you some Pali terms it, now. So we're talking about viveka jena piti sukena, which is rapture and bliss born of seclusion. Seclusion, okay. Um, Samadhi jena piti sukena, which is rapture and bliss born of concentration. That's the, the kind of positive affect you get in second jhana. The first is from the first jhana. So yes. this rapture and bliss born of concentration is in the second jhana. It's a more refined kind of affect. And in the third jhana, we have uh, nipitikena sukena, bliss free from rapture. So this is, this is more, rapture is more gross. It's more kind of maybe in your face. It's, uh, and bliss is a good word because bliss, ah, you know, yes. it's kind of full on. But it's getting kind of, you could almost say quieter or subtler, uh, subtler grades of happiness. So this, yes. uh, by the third jhana, this bliss free from rapture. Um, but then in the fourth jhana, you've got um, parisudhena uh, chetasa pariyodatena, pure bright mind. Uh, oh, no, sorry, that's a, so, but anyway, we, we have uh, what we know. Listen, you made your point, you made your point yeah. very clearly. Okay, good. And the only, the only uh, uh, connotation that I would add to that is that truly, as you get into the path, mm -hmm. uh, you feel pleasure. But the end is not pleasurable. Yeah, it's not the it, end. It is transcendent. So yes, it is true. And I, I knew that. I knew that when I read it the first time, I thought, okay, I need to seek... Uh, states of mind that are pleasurable. It's like a, a, a child that's crying. You have to give him a uh, pacifier first. And then you care for them, you feed them, you do that, and then you teach them. The mind is like that. First, it has to be in a You're state of it not... Sound quite mundane. No, but uh, it, I mean, I'm just saying because pleasure, the way we understand affect affect and attachment is mundane. Let's be clear about that because the, the uh, more you go you into the middle... Me, could I exclude myself from that? Please? Well, I mean... But because let I don't me see now. affect as mundane. Especially not these kind of affects. Well, if you transcendence... <laughs> let, let me read the first sutra of uh, the, uh, the uh, Four Noble Truths. Sure. Uh, there are two extremes that are not to be indulged in by one who has gone forth. Which two? That which is devoted to sensory pleasure. Sensory, and I don't say yeah. sensual because it's, it's, uh, it's sensory. Sensory pleasure with reference to sensory objects. Base, vulgar, common, ignoble, Unprofitable. Now he's he's taking it to the you know he's too much, too much. But it is definitely trivial and mundane. It's just like okay, yeah, it's a sensory, big deal. Transcendence uh, has he, to be. Uh, he's talking about the five senses there. So there's six yes. senses in Buddhism, but these are specifically from the five, yeah, the, the five senses that Westerners talk the, about. The five senses plus the mind, because as you refine more and more no, and more no, into no, entrapture. No, I don't think he's talking about the mind. When he's talking about sense pleasure, he will. It's the five senses that he's talking about. I'm it, sure. He doesn't say five. 
Uh, elsewhere, I can, I can find you support that he's referring to well, the fight. Well, not in that we're, we're, we're not going to fight about semantics or, but well, here. No, no, in... But the significance is because the, the pleasure from jhana is of the sixth sense, of the mind sense. They're okay. generated so, in there the you mind. Go. That's so the we agree. We That's agree. So yeah. he talks about sens uh, sensory blah, 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 and that which is devoted to self affliction. Because he tried on both ends, yeah, yeah. you know, painful, blah, 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 blah. Avoiding both of these extremes, the middle way realized by the one thus gone or the Tathagata, mm -hmm. or whatever you want to call him, producing, and this is where we go with this, it produces vision, mm -hmm. knowledge, mm -hmm. calm, direct knowledge, mm -hmm. self awakening, self transcendence, and unbinding unbinding okay. um, so that's that's the beginning of it so what he's saying is that we have to go between the extremes and then go in the middle and then what he he, he unbinding means that you you transcend it you, you go outside of the so you have to go beyond affect he's thinking He's not saying go and be on that What is unbinding? What is unbinding? Does he anywhere say in that sutta to go beyond that What I, I am interpreting that unbinding yeah. breaks down everything, including affect, thinking, rationality, logic, etc., etc. What does that mean to no longer experience affect? Or what do you mean? Unbinding is just taking it all apart <laughs> and that means what the mind take apart you tell me what it is to unbind yeah i mean that's the word that he, that uh, buddha uses unbinding well maybe bound in the sense of being stuck to being glued to so the zero is zero and the one is one there's clean. there's no difference it's just you know pure pure existing beyond mind because this reality is not bound to itself because it doesn't know well, it only knows the, through is. So, so what is leading to this unbinding? So it does the, it's the middle path that's leading to this? Yeah. So, so the investigation. The investigation be, into being leads to non-being. So he's describing and, jhana as the middle path. And jhana, as we see, includes extreme states of pleasure. So what it seems to me is, and don't forget, the, the Noble Eightfold Path is the path of jhana. It's a sequential path leading mm -hmm. uh, that, that goes step by step up to samma samadhi, which is defined right. as the four jhana, which is defined right. as pleasurable. So it's yep. through bathing the mind in these very uh, specific positive uh, affective states that uh, the, the, all the trash is kind of destroyed. Uh, uh, you know, the, the habitual passions, the, all this clinging and so on. Somehow, uh, it's the clinging that's the problem. Like not the, rewiring the brain through not the stuff. It you know, the stuff is not the problem. It is the clinging. So the binding yeah. is the problem. So yeah. affect is binding. But he's using these affects to unbind the mind. It, yes, uh, yes. The, the 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 path has to include affect and and um, and. Um, uh, thinking, uh, rationality. Yeah, well, the, well, can I bring in something that he it goes both ways? It relates to this. So, in uh, um, the uh, Anguttara Nikaya, uh, 4.189, Satchikarania uh, Sutta. Um, so, he's talking about the. Um, I just took about the eight liberations. So, that would. That would include the four jhana and the four immaterial states uh, and how they're to be directly realized by the body. Um, so he, he's, but he's saying, he's talking about four things that, that need to be done. There's, there's, there's things that need to be directly realized with, with or through the body. And he's, he's often talking about uh, in the context of jhana and, and the deathless state and so on, touching them with the body, which is, we could 
I use the word cautiously here because depending on how we understand affect, but we could see that as the affective side of experience, uh, realizing with the body. It's not a conceptual thing. It's not an intellectual thing. So that's mm -hmm. one. And then we've got things to be realized, uh, uh, so things to be directly realized through recollection, uh, I guess, which is not mindfulness there. Things to, yeah, that would be like the satipatthana. Uh, things to be directly realized through vision and things to be directly realized through wisdom. Uh, so I'm not saying that the, this, uh, the clear seeing, the kind of somewhat more cognitive side is not important, but I would say it's nowhere, nowhere can we consider it to be more important than the affective realization. There is equally important. Two aspects. Equally important because yeah. as, affect and uh, effect or uh, thinking, uh, uh, determination, understanding, all that is one ball of wax. Again, those are different aspects of sentience. So. We can do one without the other, though. So there's examples of people who are uh, seen with wisdom but have not touched with the body, and their job is not done. And maybe I can give you another quote. So, well, uh, well, listen, uh, I am at the end of my rope. I'm going to uh, unbind. Okay. Unfortunately, I could continue here for another day or two. <laughs> uh, this goes back to the original comment, uh, Jairo. Buddha goes out there, he had this unbinding, and, and he actually, he was so unbound that he said, do I want to talk about this to anybody? <laughs> because I have a feeling they're not going to get it. They're not going to understand it. So he had to, somehow he thought, well, do I, do I go forward or do I shut up? Because he could have been very contented right there, just doing nothing under the, the, the Bodhi tree. But somehow, I guess the, the, they say that it was devas, which I don't know where they are, but uh, his, own, his own thinking thought was like, like the sun, you cannot avoid radiating, right? So I guess that he thought, well, if I'm going to radiate, might as well radiate on people that are just looking for the sunshine. They're not in a cave or trying to away from, uh, go away from light. So he thought immediately of his old buddies that he had been suffering with. First, he, he went back and... Teachers. Because yes, he said they before had that, yes. dust in their yeah. eyes. They were yes. like, they were so close. They could get it, but they were, right. he realized they were dead. Right, so right, he, right. Yeah, right. So he, he had to go to these buddies, and, and, and that's what he said. The, the guys, they looked at him like, what the hell? Did you, <laughs> look at you. You're all plump and everything. You, you, you didn't get it, really. Did, <laughs> you're, that's it. You're, you're a traitor to the cause whatever cause you know, they thought they, they were going for. And, and they said, no, 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 please, no, listen to me. Please. So the guys were a little bit obtruse, but at the same time, they were open-minded, which is a good thing to remember. You know, we have to be open-minded and, you know, try to find meaning in everything. And they get, then they sat down and he said, okay, here it is. The two extremes, the dipole, this and that. And then it's in the middle. It's not in suffering or in, you know, pleasure. It's beyond pleasure and pain i.e. in the middle between them or all around them, outside of the boundaries of pleasure and pain, that you're going to find what you're looking for, the ultimate meaning, the ultimate, like, I am it. That, you know. So um, how can you just think about this? How can you explain to somebody that hasn't gone through this exercise for a, quite a while, how can you go into the depth of the jhanas, the this, the, the, you know, the mundane, the trivial versus the paramundane or the, you know, transcendent, the idea that zero is one and one is zero. How, how can, I mean, people don't even, they don't even know what we're talking about in general. We are like three bozos out there, three freakies. We're not talking about soccer, fish and chips. <laughs> We're not we talk, talking about, about we're not, <laughs> we haven't, we haven't mentioned the word, the immensely word of COVID, woo, you know, are we complete aliens in this world, the three of us? So talking about these things, it has to be about somebody that's already in the middle way, it's just trying to get in line to go, okay, let me get this uh, straight. 
uh, very difficult because they, like in the Bible, they say that the eye of the needle is very, very small. Well, the eye of the Dharma is extremely small. It's just, you're distracted by all kinds of things and going into that wormhole of knowledge, of self-knowledge, of uh, unbinding is very, very improbable. We are an exception to the human rule. We are truly an exception to the human rule. These things that we're talking about, this is not human, almost. <laughs> this is meta-human or inhuman or whatever it is. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It just feels, it feels good. It feels good, but beyond pleasure and pain. So it is, to me, this middle way, I can't get enough of it. I just can't get enough of this feeling of oneness with because now I can say, and people can say, you are absolutely crazy, Lewis. You just don't know what you're talking about. I can say that I am omniscient in the not that I know everything. I'm not a you know, I'm not a PhD in all the sciences of humanity, but I have gone further beyond that, which is to understand the nature of anything and everything. So I have transcended good and evil, pleasure and pain. I am the whole of reality looking at itself in a wonderful game of soccer where it doesn't matter if you win by one zero or you lose by one zero. It, nothing really matters. And yet everything is, has a tremendous weight you know, the, the, uh, let's put it this way. The mind is, a, is like a very, very heavy object, like a black hole, you could say. Like a big black hole. The more you, the bigger the mind is, the deeper it goes, the more in the middle it is, the, the heavier it becomes. I would say that enlightenment is not light. It is the heaviest black hole. And heavy in in heavy men. It's it's <laughs> heavy in significance, <laughs> in meaning, in purpose, in importance, oh. in fundamentality, autotelism. It's just like the whole thing just falls onto itself and then cracks itself like a black a white hole. And it's like the whole universe coalesces into itself and then creates itself again you know like the big crunch the big the big bang big crunch big bang the zero the one it's just an absolute feeling of transcendence uh, an enlightened mind goes in and becomes extremely dense with knowledge with uh, uh, wisdom with understanding but a transcendent understanding. It's not, it doesn't matter if the molecule is done, but H2O and this is the speed and momentum. This is, the, it goes beyond all that. With three fundamental laws, not the four fundamental forces, three fundamental laws of anicca, dukkha, and anatta. It explains everything, it explains itself. It implodes into a black hole and explodes into a, a white hole. It is the Alpha and the Omega. It is the Judge and Redeemer. It is sin and and forgiveness. It is absolute love. Uh, the uh, most psychopathy. It is the. It's everything and nothing at the same time. It's just 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 a phenomenal thing. And is, is it like falling I, in love? Is well, it like that? It's beyond falling in love. Is it like you know, an orgasm? You got to be when you are in this state of mind. You have to be careful with every word you say. Because like that uh, German psychologist said, we cannot not communicate. So everything you say can be construed in a thousand different ways. So love, okay, let's define love. Let's define, you know, affect. Let's define knowing. Let's define feeling. Let's define everything. So every word carries a lot of weight. And, and you've got to be cautious how you understand anything and everything. So uh, if you ask me, on the conventional side of hum being human, I love immensely I, because I'm not afraid of anything. I mean, just a pure love. But how do you define that pure love in human, human terms? 
you know, it's difficult to understand. So you have to go into the transcendent side where, where I feel one with everything. So there's no distinction. There's no duality. So I'm looking at you and I see myself. I'm looking at you. I see myself and look at the lamp and I see myself. I am everything. And I'm nothing. I am so, Luis. So that's I am the, Justin. That's, <laughs> oh, my mother. So that's, that's what mother. I call a peak being, where you have transcended every word, every notion, every pleasure, every pain. You are absolutely unbound. Thank you, kind mother. <laughs> and uh, that's, uh, that's you, two hours instead of uh, one hour and 50 minutes instead uh -oh. of one hour. I'm already in trouble. Uh, two hours somebody. wasted of your life. This, this, this was absolutely <laughs> fantastic. Thank you. This is absolutely fantastic. You, you got the, you always get the best out of me, you know, because you allow this conversation to go into places that normally the mind doesn't go. And to me, it's just, uh, you know, I could be talking to myself. It would be a very short conversation. Very, just like, okay. But when, when I am able to express this in conventional terms, talking about the ineffable, the unnameable, the unborn, the unfabricated nirvana, nibbana, the extinguishment and the unbinding of everything, that to me is just uh, very pleasurable, if I may say. <laughs> Although I can, go, with, I can go without it. Get yourself on the toe, see how that feels. Well, I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna be doing some work out there. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's, what a wonderful, what a wonderful uh, Zoom. I think, uh, I hope you recorded everything duly and that we can share that out there. For whoever is uh, trying to get into the needle's eye, uh, like the turtle, like you know, pokes the nose up and, yes, and goes uh, through that. We've already had thousands of views. Or uh, well, I, it's yes, uh, I, I watched uh, the videos a thousand times. So there is there's <laughs> <laughs> like narcissus that can't get enough of himself in the in the water reflection. Right? Trying to understand it. Uh, I just uh, I have to thank you again. It's just, this was uh, wonderful. Thank you, Luis. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, guys, both of you. Um, Luis, uh, I had an idea to, I'm not sure if we are connected on Facebook, but maybe to Jairo I can send you, uh, I'll try and find after this call uh, a video uh, from the Peak State Institute, just mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, perhaps see see what you might think about the possibility of contrast. The contrast idea ideas. I was saying about there being a peak states used as a term to 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 describe a a category of various experiences, and uh, it would be interesting to hear uh, how you would feel about if I can find the appropriate. Video Absolutely. Might be I'm always send it to me in message. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah when exactly. I'm not doing stuff, I, I sent you an email on on Gmail. I think it was to me, uh, Justin. Yeah. Oh, did you? I'm really, really bad with emails. Usually. Oh. Uh, so I, did I? I probably didn't reply, did I? I I saw you on LinkedIn. Also, I think you're on LinkedIn. Am and, I? Oh my gosh! I didn't. I, I thought you know. I thought I saw you on LinkedIn, and then I sent you a. a an email from my Gmail address, uh, oh. usc.ldp at uh, gmail.com. I just wanted oh. to, can I have you have my email? So if you USC. want to send something, usce.ldp at gmail.com. It probably ended up in the, uh, in the junk, uh, <laughs> junk file. Like, I'm, I'm oh, really, really thing? bad. Like I get so much junk that I tend to not even look at it. Yeah. There <laughs> you are. Yeah, I found that. I just did a search for it. Cool. Anyway, so, so if, if you, you want to, Facebook, I am on Facebook, but I don't use it because uh, oh, okay. it's just a. Uh, I, I I stalk I stalk my me. family. I stalk my family, my kids. You know, on YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> well, that messaging app on that on um, Facebook is a good way to get through to me. Or, yeah. or maybe I should give you my WhatsApp if you ever do want to. Talk to uh, WhatsApp. Uh, yeah, uh, through my phone number, I can give you my phone number, uh, my cell number. If you want to write it down. I'm writing mine. So uh, uh, when if I'm, you make this video public, does then does the chat become public as well? I don't uh, you don't want, want to, to, you uh, don't want to share your phone number, right? You no. Can, I tell you what. Uh, they they send, reply to 
Re reply me, reply okay, to my go. email with your phone number. That's yeah, I sent it to you privately, sir. Okay, forty-four seven seven six zero nine. I don't mind you having a hide about it if it was going public. No, I understand. I understand. I understand. You got to be cautious out there. This it's a nasty world. It's a duka world. <laughs> <laughs> or duki because okay. it's shitty. Listen uh, again. What, what, what a pleasurable uh, um, experience uh, as always, yes. and I'm looking forward to the next one. In the meantime, uh, Heidel, uh, share my phone with uh, with uh, Justin, and you can. You can hit me anytime because I, I'm always in and out of uh, reality. That means that while I'm working, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm sharing, and then I go back. I'm, I'm constantly just uh, jumping around because wow. this, this, this way of feeling, this peak is, is uh, follow me where, wherever I go. I am it. I'm quite reclusive, but I, it, I, I might respond to messages even though I yeah. might initiate them. <laughs> <laughs> All right, listen, okay. guys. Uh, what a thank what a pleasure! You. All right, we'll see you. Thank we'll you. see you next yes, week. You guys. Yes, thank, you, awesome. thank you, Luis. Thank you, Luis. Take care. Let's see you next time. Bye.